Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Extraterrestrial Civilizations by Isaac Asimov. So this is a non-fiction book, it's a hardback, uh, we do have a blurb so I'm going to read that out to you, and then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs before I share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... Extraterrestrial Civilizations. Ever since the concept of other worlds in space was first advanced by the Greek philosopher Anaxagoras in the 5th century BC, scientists and astronomers have striven to answer that eternal question. Are we alone? Isaac Asimov here makes a fresh and meticulous analysis of the universe as we know it. He concludes with the startling statement, the number of planets in our galaxy on which a technological civilization is now in being is roughly 530,000. A bold statement, but one which he supports with highly convincing evidence. It is inconceivable to him that the requisites for extraterrestrial life, proximity to a star, water, atmosphere, organic compounds, energy, dry land and oceans, do not exist somewhere in the estimated 650 million habitable planets in our galaxy alone, not to mention all the other galaxies in the universe. Asimov holds our undivided attention as he gradually builds an alarmingly convincing case. We are not alone. It's just a matter of time until we are able to communicate with and learn from the nearest civilizations which undoubtedly exist. Aliens! Um, now I will say, I mean, when was this book published? 1980. So already a little bit of the science in it is maybe not quite up to date, you know? But So this line here made me laugh here from uh, the first chapter of the Earth. Thus, whatever the Greek philosopher may have thought as to the cause of rain, the common uneducated farmer may have thought of rain, as Aristophanes jokingly says in one of his plays, as Zeus pissing through a sieve. It amused me, but I hate the word jokingly, so there is that. And so we get this as well. well. There's a lot of footnotes in this, but this footnote did make me chuckle. Science deals only with phenomena that can be reproduced, observations that, under certain fixed conditions, can be made by anybody of normal intelligence, observations upon which reasonable men can agree. And then the footnote says, I won't bother trying to define a reasonable man. I suspect that one convenient assumption we can make is that anyone bothering to read this book is a reasonable man. There's another footnote where he says, There are books that have been written describing how plants seem aware of human speech and react with apparent intelligence to it. As far as biologists can tell, however, there is no scientific merit whatsoever to such views. And, uh, yeah, I mean, this is true. There's a lot of people who say if you sing to plants, it'll make them grow faster. But studies have shown no, which is unsurprising, you know. And he says, uh, he's talking about here what he calls the first science fiction story to be written by a professional scientist, but not by a long shot the last. And it was written by uh, Johann Kepler, 1571 to 1630, an astronomer of the first rank, and was published posthumously in 1633. It was entitled Somnium because the hero reached the moon in a dream. And I just thought that was interesting because most people credit uh, Mary Shelley and Frankenstein with inventing science fiction, but clearly not. And here uh, he talks about some of his own work, and I've actually, I think I did a review of this book, and I definitely talked about it on my channel. Uh, he says, in 1954, I myself published a novel, Lucky Star and the Oceans of Venus, in which the planet was described as having a planetary ocean. But only two years later, our thoughts about Venus were revolutionised. And in fact, in this uh, book, as, <laughs> there's like an introduction to it where he says, basically, the science that this relied on is no longer accurate. This story is impossible. But I hope you'll enjoy it anyway, you know. We get a reference to the famous Orson Welles' War of the Worlds broadcast as well, which is cool. You can actually listen to that on YouTube. So he says here, and I thought this was just an interesting point, he says, Against the background of water, there is in living organisms a rapid and never-ending interplay involving complex molecules made up of anywhere from a dozen to a million atoms. These are found in nature, only in living organisms and in the dead remnants of once living organisms. And he points out, they can also be formed in the laboratory. In addition, uncounted thousands of such compounds, not quite like any to be found in living organisms or their residues, have also been synthesized by chemists. But then chemists are living organisms, so that even the synthetic molecules that are not found in nature are the result of the actions of living organisms. Yeah, good point. He also says, um, The Earth is so massive and the energy of its turning is so huge that the Earth's rotation is slowing very slowly. The length of the day is increasing by one second every 100,000 years. Quite crazy. Just an interesting note here, bearing in mind we're living through a time of pandemics, he says, the English astronomer Fred Hoyle, born 1915, is sufficiently impressed by this to suggest that in comets, which in some ways have the composition of interstellar clouds, compounds form that are complex enough to possess the properties of life, that the equivalent of viruses are formed, and that comets may therefore be the cause of the occasional pandemics that afflict the Earth by sending new viruses into the atmosphere. It is an interesting suggestion, but it's hard to see how it can be taken seriously. Well, we know this one was caused by people eating meat. There's an estimate, uh, I think from Carl Sagan, where uh, it's believed that in our galaxy, 10 stars are born each year on average, which is a lot. 
And I just thought this was interesting too. He says um, he's looking at satellite mass and he's got a chart of the satellite mass for each planet of the solar system, uh, excluding Pluto because Pluto didn't really count. And this, and this was before Pluto was downgraded and was still a planet. So even then, he was like, mm, I don't know, it doesn't fit in with the other planets, does it? And I just thought this was, uh, again, fascinating. He says, it always yields ludicrously short intervals of time when we try to calculate how long it would take a virus, a bacterium, a pair of flies, a pair of mice, a pair of human beings, even a pair of elephants, to produce offspring equal in mass to the entire Earth, assuming free reproduction, unlimited food, and no deaths but by old age. In the case of human beings, if we start with one pair and multiply them at an overall rate of 3.3% a year, easily within human capacity, the ascendance of that one pair will be equal in mass to the entire Earth in 1600 years. And uh, again, an interesting little insight into the human nature here, he says, The human being is intelligent enough to hold a grudge. The loser, remembering the injury to his own chances of survival, may then strike to kill the winner by trickery, or from ambush, or by rallying friends, if he cannot do it by main force. And the loser may do this not for any direct good it will do him, or for any increase in the chance of his survival, but out of sheer anger at the memory of the harm done him. It is not likely that any species other than a human being kills for revenge, or to prevent revenge, since dead people tell no tales and plot no ambushes. This is not because human beings are more evil than other animals, but because they are more intelligent than other animals, and can remember long enough and specifically enough to give meaning to the concept of revenge. And he's talking about people sighting aliens, and he says, such reports are usually based on the sighting of something that the sighters cannot explain and that they or, they, or someone else on their behalf, explain as representing an interstellar spaceship, often by saying, but what else can it be, as though their own ignorance is a decisive factor. As long as human beings have existed, they have experienced things that they could not explain. The more sophisticated a human being is, the more widely experienced, the more likely he or she is to expect the inexplicable and to greet it as an interesting challenge to be investigated soberly, if possible, and without jumping to conclusions. The rule is to seek the simplest and most ordinary explanation consistent with the facts and to allow oneself to be driven with greater and greater reluctance to the more complex and unusual when nothing else will do. And if one is left with no likely explanation at all, then it must be left there. The sophisticated observer has usually learned to live with uncertainty. Unsophisticated human beings with limited experience are impatient with puzzles and seek solutions, often pouncing on something they have vaguely heard of if it satisfies an apparently fundamental human need for drama and excitement. He also points out, and I've read this factoid before from Asimov, if human beings continue to multiply at their present rate, the total mass of flesh and blood will equal the total mass of the universe in 9,000 years or so. Basically, population growth, unsustainable mean. Leading cause of climate change as well is that we have too many people, basically. And finally, I just want to end on this. Uh, where he talks, he talks about the why of trying to find these extraterrestrial civilizations. He says, Yet one must ask, why ought humanity to engage in the task of monitoring space for signals from extraterrestrial civilizations? Why should we spend tens of billions of dollars when the chances are that we may find nothing at all? After all, what if, despite all my reasoning in this book, there are no extraterrestrial civilizations? Or if there are, that there are none so close to us that we can detect their signals? Or if there are, that they aren't signaling? Or if they are, that they are doing so in a way that will elude us altogether? or if it doesn't, that the signals we receive will be uninterpretable. Any of these things is possible, so let us assume the worst, and suppose that despite all our efforts, we end up with no recognisable signals at all from anywhere. In that case, we will really have wasted much money. Perhaps not. Suppose that the labour of building Project Cyclops and the task of searching the sky takes 20 years altogether and costs $100 billion. That is $5 billion a year in a world in which the various nations spend a total of $400 billion a year on armaments. And whereas the money spent on armaments only stimulates hatred and fear and increases steadily the chance that the nations of the Earth will wipe each other out, and perhaps all humanity, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence is something that would surely have a uniting effect on us all. The mere thought of other civilizations advanced beyond our own, of a galaxy full of such civilizations, can't help but emphasize the pettiness of our own quarrels and shame us into more serious attempts at cooperation. And if the failure of the search should cause us to suspect that we are, after all, the only civilization in the galaxy, might that not increase the sense of the preciousness of our world and ourselves and make us more reluctant to risk it all in childish quarrels? So yeah, Extraterrestrial Civilizations by Isaac Asimov. Some fascinating stuff in this. I don't necessarily agree with all of his reasoning, but I can understand why he reasoned that way. He also kind of points out that because the universe is so massive, even if there is, is loads of intelligent life out there, we're just probably never going to come across it. So in which case it's kind of a moot point anyway. But yeah, Extraterrestrials by Isaac Asimov. Did enjoy, gave it a pretty strong 3.5 out of 5. So there we have it, that's what I made of Extraterrestrial Civilization by Isaac Asimov. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.